Hola, hola, bona tarda. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, our panelists. Uh, welcome to this Creative Technologies Cafe, when, where all these artists and visualists will present their work. In fact, I will present briefly themselves, the, uh, each one, and they, they will present their work also briefly. And then we will have a short questions and answers session. We will start with Nazare Soares. Uh, she's a visual artist, founder of Invisible, Invisible, uh, Invisible World Drum Artists Association. Yeah. Uh, her work explores uh, film languages and methodologies, immersive environments, speculative design, and new media. Yeah. Um, in fact, he has teamed with the artist uh, Javier Benjarano uh, in the creation of Monochrome, the show that could, we could show yesterday uh, featuring Oscar Mulero. Uh, please, Nazare. Yes, uh, so hello, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to be uh, here. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, here uh, for, um, uh, collaborating with uh, Javier Bejarano as part of uh, Monochrome. Uh, but then I will uh, probably uh, present uh, different uh, works, more recent works that are more in the context of uh, sound and technology. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, based in Norway, uh, working between uh, Spain, Scotland and, um, and Norway. In Norway, we, uh, I have a collaborator, Amalia von Fara, and then we are co-founded of Invisible Drum, uh, Invisible Drum is uh, an association that um, approaches to poetic gestures through ritualistic and ceremony um, methodologies and uh, sound technology, ancient sound technology as uh, shamanism or a different kind of uh, sound healings. Well, uh, is uh, we what we do is uh, we create uh, we approach to translations so we uh, create a system animistic system where we can um, have that poetic gesture 2.20 i go in straight to 2.0 so this is the first project where everything is started and it's the sonic architecture of the inner space Okay, this is a sound installation completely in a dark space uh, where, uh, you, um, where, where you are thrown in a completely unknown space. You experience the space with the sound, uh, interactive uh, sound uh, spatial composition and then with the headphones and then you have a track, the, uh, you are tr tracked tracked by uh, sensors, and then uh, through pure data, we process, you know, that uh, sound composition. There are some objects, sound events, and sound characters that are uh, uh, just placed through um, the space. This is a drawing because you are completely in a dark space, so only with sound. So you start to, uh, we want to kind of, uh, activate the inner virtual, no? because this is all a meta critique which, for what is the virtual in relation to the body and in relation to uh, new technologies. Uh, so then this is the map. The map was uh, shown an invisible sonic architecture uh, created from a 2.2 mode shamanic drum. Okay, So there is an invisible drum in a way that we approach to devices um, speculative devices, and then we create a big drum. It's invisible, you go inside, and then through this um, exposure of uh, sound energy, uh, you get into some kind of altered state. So the diagram, uh, you can see first layer, you have the sonic architecture, the drum is a 2.20 node, and then the other uh, diagram shows the composition made from movements, motions, and qualities. Each of the, uh, also there is a, a spiral, which is the interaction that you have with the sound objects. Each time you touch one of them, you, uh, it will react 
It's an autonomous system, it works by itself, and then as soon as you enter into the room, completely dark, you have an uh, interaction with that system. So this is, uh, was first presented, uh, presented in the art science, sorry, no, in uh, Trondheim, Norway. Okay, and then uh, in the Land among Kunst uh, there. And then a uh, uh, second was uh, in June 2017, was presented in the Art Science Museum of Singapore, part of Creative Young Cognition 2017. So the research present explores and presents a meta-critique of site perception in relation to virtual, real, and imaginary spaces. Furthermore, it explores this place of ritualistic practices within contemporary, uh, contemporary advanced technology societies. 2.20 approaches to speculative design for developing conceptual ideas of meditative design, the meditative devices. This approach is inspired by ancient technology of animistic practice using for communicating within animate and inanimate realms. See, the mind sort of believes that if it shuts off completely, that it will, in a way, cease to exist. So from a media ecology perspective, we understand that affect and emotion has a vulnerable exposure to new technologies. Bodily and haptic information defeats the information contained in the linguistic system, making the last secondary. 2.20 avoids perpetuating optic center ways of relating to environments, working towards creative devices where full body and senses experience immersion through multiple levels of processing visceral information. 2.20 is created from concerns about communication, mainly based on semantic and linguistic system. It, offer, it offers a somatosensory system functioning as a communication tool. Through effect and intensity of energies, encompasses all vibrational manifestations. It functions as a physical system that embraces potential in virtual dimensions, thus understanding coexistence of systems at multiple levels of resonances. And I want you to imagine that when you breathe in the air, you're breathing in all the atoms that you can possibly imagine. O Oystan Jorstad is the uh, sound programmer. Okay, so this is the last version of the 2.20. It was made in Dora, which is uh, a Second World War bunker in Trondheim. So we were interested to see the impact of this kind of um, building, you know, the materials of the concrete and the steel into a Trondheim fjord. We connect that uh, space with uh, three different locations in the mouth of the fjord, and then we start to uh, develop a methodology in field work where we uh, collect data, experience, and then we do drum journeys with the uh, shaman, and then through that drum journeys, we start to uh, weave the narrative. We also uh, filter that narrative, trying to uh, avoid any kind of associative element. So what we do, we, uh, we try to connect with things that are in common with the environment, but also with us to drumming, or such, uh, going through the journey. So this is some of the experience of people who have been there, that you can see uh, the experience or the virtuality they have experienced through the sound space in a completely black. This is some of the photographs of the space. We have a waiting room. It's one person at a time, so it's only you thrown into the known. 
It's kind of scary, so we need to prepare people before going in, be, be really uh, sure that people is all right to get in, and then they can stay as long as they want, and then when they come out, norm, uh, more often they are very, very uh, in shock, physical shock, because it's very primary uh, uh, sensation, from primary experience, and then we need to kind of calm them down and try to, to just uh, allow them to, to express what they have uh, felt. Yes, yeah, so I'm just running out of time. I'm just going through a little bit of the uh, pictures here. And uh, yeah, this is uh, some elements in the room that can bring a little bit of light, and then that creates after images on the retina. So then these after images are projected into some kind of shades that you start to see in the, in the darkness because the optic nerve kind of makes sense of the of the dark can construct, so start to make up things. So that is the virtual that we are approaching, the inner virtual. The narrative is just brought by the spectator, or the visitors, navigator, we call them. And then, yeah, I wanted to present the breathing room, but I don't have uh, much time, but maybe if you want to approach later and we can just, uh, I can just present or explain to you a little bit more of my work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, Natale. Uh, thank you very Thanks much. Sorry, try to <laughs> sort it up. Okay, then we will go for Tom Schofield, best known uh, for his alias, music alias, uh, as a oh. producer, uh, Comnob Pax. As we saw yesterday, he also has a perfect command with, with visuals, uh, visual language and design. Uh, on the visual level, he has a vivid aesthetic, like the recurring themes are vivid neon, saturated colors, and science fiction classic uh, from the 80s, as we saw yesterday as he was the visualist for God 9. Please. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, wow, that's quite loud. Um, yeah, I'm at Sonar this year uh, performing with Code 9, and Japanese director Koji Moromoto. We performed yesterday at the Sonar Dome, which was fantastic. It was a really good turnout and I always like to play in giant LED walls. It's always good fun. Um, I can show you some of the footage that we shot in Japan last year because I don't have any footage from yesterday. Um, yeah, we performed at the Liquid Room in Tokyo, which was an amazing gig. I cheekily asked Red Bull to put the biggest LED wall they could afford in the Liquid Room, and they said yes, and it was fantastic. Wait a minute, let's see if this works. Uh, this might be quite loud. Let me see. Let's see if it plays. Oh, come on. Is this working? Oh, yeah. So you get the picture. Um, so basically, it was a collaboration between myself, a fellow Scottish person, Code 9, from Hyperdub, and animator Koji Moromoto, who was actually one of the lead animators from Akira. So when Steve asked me if I wanted to get involved with the project, I instantly said yes. Um, yeah, I could quickly show you how we work together um, I was given permission to have access to all of the anime that he directed. So I've spent a few months going through various clips from his movies and then been able to kind of chop them up and remix them live to Code 9, who's also been remixing lots of vintage Japanese computer games. But some, of, let's see if this works. Yeah, so this was some original. Um, illustrations that Morimoto sent to me that then I put into 3D software and made some clips that we can VJ with. Uh, so that was really, I was really pleased to be able to get to play about with his stuff. Um, let's see if that works, sorry. Um, 
Oops, I'll just quit that. Um, and um, yeah, okay, I can talk about another project I've been, <coughs> that I've just started. Uh, I spend quite a lot of time generating my content in 3D, which involves a lot of rendering and a lot of hanging about, waiting for it to happen. And I've got movie files that then I perform live. And I kind of got quite bored waiting on things to render. So took a course in Berlin at the Spectrum and learned about Unity, which is a game engine. And I'm now able to perform visuals live and in real time with even greater sort of detail than I would get with pre-rendered stuff. So yeah, learning coding was quite tough. Uh, I think the second day of the workshop, I just wanted to go home and cry because it was so intense learning how to code. But I can show you uh, what I managed to do after two days of the workshop, which I was quite chuffed with. So I kind of built and designed this in Cinema 4D. And then it's relatively straightforward to import it into the game engine. And I can interact with this in real time. So when I'm performing my music, this would be running in the background. And I would easily be able to sort of play with it live while I'm DJing. And yeah, I'm just, this is the beginning of a whole new adventure for me, really, when it comes to live visuals. Um, yeah, I can, I, mean, I actually have some audio as well. This clip isn't too great, but you get the idea. Um, and there's some more particle effects added to this. So it really brings it to life when it will be on the, the screen. Um, what else can I show you? Yeah, so all of this stuff that I've been doing is a kind of continuation of the artwork that I created for my last EP that was released in Planet Mew last year. And I'm like really influenced by a lot of Japanese manga and anime and Francis Bacon painting. So it's a kind of mashup of those two influences to create these kind of surrealistic, hyper-real plastic kind of sculptures. And I'm also got more involved with a club night at Berkine called Leisure System, which my friends Sam Barker and Ned Beckett have been running for a while. Uh, I'm now their kind of in-house designer and I uh, also DJ at it as well. It's in the new space in Berkine, Saula, which is a more experimental space. It's not just straight up banging techno. Uh, the last time Ned and I played there, we mainly played jungle and hardcore, so it was really good to break away from the traditional view on what Berkine is. But I'll quickly show you a music video that I created for my last EP, if I can find it. I've got about four minutes left. But yeah, I shot and directed this in my bedroom because the budget was tiny and I didn't really have any more options. But you can have a quick look at this. Influenced a lot by Fantasia, a Disney movie, actually. We can play this for three minutes.
yeah, get the idea. To see if there's anything else I can chat about quickly. Um, yeah, I've also got an ongoing, I like to work in print media as well. And I've been doing these picture mix series, so it's like a free downloadable mix tape. And you also have access to high res PDF print work as well. Um, and I'm, yeah, these are quite heavily influenced by uh, comic book artists like Mobius. Because um, I just think that there's everything so oversaturated when it comes to mixtapes. I thought it'd be nice to have a free bit of art that you can download and print for your wall. So these are all available on SoundCloud if you want to check it out. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it, I think. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so now going out of the screen, we can find the work of Pablo Balbuena, whose practical and research is focused on space, uh, time, and perception. Uh, some key elements of this exploration are the overlap of the real and the virtual, uh, the links be between space and time, uh, using light and sound as prime matter. Uh, please. Thanks, Irma, for the, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to, I brought, since the time is quite compressed, uh, and I already uh, was in a panel on Wednesday, so I kind of introduced uh, uh, part of my work. I brought just two projects today, and uh, they are, so I, I'm trying to be a bit more sort of specific rather than trying to cover uh, a lot of stuff, trying to just speak about, uh, about maybe more little things, no? And, um, these two projects, my, uh, maybe I just do a very short introduction about my work, which is I, I usually work uh, in C2, uh, CITES specifically, which uh, for me it's important. I don't understand this as, uh, well, let's say that I'm a visual artist. That's probably <laughs> the first thing to say. I work mostly with sound and light. But for me it's really important that the work is a response to a place. And when I'm think about this is not, it's not about adapting uh, a work in terms of scale or size to a certain location. It's really that the work responds that it only has uh, sense in that uh, precise location. So what I do is to, I like to, to describe it as bringing the virtual into, into the real. So I use light and sound to, to create potential alternative realities, but in a way where your body engage with it in our sort of normal universal language of, of space and time, of your body moving through space and, and engaging, understanding that space through rather, let's say, traditional ways, no? analog ways. Uh, and maybe another idea that it's interesting to, in interesting to introduce before is like I'm, I, what I'm doing also is like I'm framing, it's I'm framing, I'm framing the digital display, I'm taking the pixels, the idea of display, the, the, the idea of points in a two-dimensional array where you can control time, and I'm projecting these points into space. So I'm using, normally, I'm identifying these pixels with architectural elements, and I se sequence these architectural elements in a way where you create motion, in, you set the space in, in motion. Uh, I brought these two projects were actually, they are from the same series of work. And not only that, but they are both f uh, based on the same typology of architectural space, which is a staircase. The first one is, uh, is a piece I did for, uh, for the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire de Genève uh, in, in Switzerland. And uh, they have this, it's a beautiful old building. They are uh, remodeling now, and, and they have this amazing, huge staircase. And this is, for me, was quite an interesting project because it's the first time that I work only with sound. I, I mostly have been, I started with light, trying to, to work a bit with sound, but it didn't make sense at the, at the time. And I have sort of followed an evolution where I'm trying to use sound the same way light is used, you know, rather than to generate a narrative or a timeline, 
to, to work with sound. There's a quote by Louis Kahn, which is a, an architect that uh, worked with light a lot. And he says, uh, uh, to, hear a sound is to, to hear a sound is to see a space. And I, I find really interesting how sound has a memory of a space, how when we are uh, listening to a sound, actually it's helping us to render where we are physically. And we are very conscious about the visual element, but we are not that conscious about sound. And actually it has a probably sometimes even more weight. No? Uh, so enough talking. And uh, this, is the, this is the piece I was referring to, the first piece. It's a sort of double, I, I call it, the, the, the series of work is, is Kinematope. And uh, the, this one is called Loop because it's, it's created in a, in a, in a spatial loop. No, I, I like the, the idea of loop, that, the way that it's being used in, in actually in sound no, as a base of a, uh, right now in electronic music as, a, as actually the sort of the brick and mortar of, uh, of, uh, of a whole composition, this tiny repetition of the same sound. But I took that, how to translate that, that idea or a similar idea into space. So in this case, the frame is an architectural element that it's sort of hacked or changed. And, uh, and basically, it's, it's just a piece where instead of thinking of a space in a, in a, as a steel space, it's tracing the space in time. It's generating a film within a space that sets that particular space or that those particular elements in 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 motion these pieces are quite difficult to document. What you're seeing is, is, uh, is, is video, is documentation video of the piece itself. There are, it's, a, it's a lot about the physical experience, so I bring this as a, in, as a try to really sort of portray these, these pieces, but it, the, the real thing is obviously the physical, the physical response of your body, of you being there at that precise moment and experiencing what is going on. And if you see the reactions of the viewers, even though the piece is, is physically non-existent, it creates a physical reaction to the body. You would expect, you would turn, and you would expect to see something coming towards you while actually there's nothing physical. And there's, this is the shift that I'm uh, working on in, in a lot of pieces. To make to make physical the, the, the virtual in a way. You know? When you work with these immersive tools, well, with sound and light, what is interesting is that you can talk to a uh, to a wide range of audiences and to very layered, I mean, you can speak, it's a very universal language, so you can speak to someone who is not necessarily going to go to a museum, but at their own level, maybe these people can, can still engage with the work at a certain level and maybe open the path to actually try to go further. And you can also address to people who are actually, you know, uh, knowledgeable of the history of art and actually make the link. So I'm interested in these tools because they are not necessarily cultural, very, they are not specific, they are not very cultural specific. They, they, can, they can speak to a wide uh, range of audiences, of cultures, but also of depth of, uh, let's say, of, let's say of, of, I don't want to say education, but yeah, education related to this type of, of practices. And time is, time is running super fast, so I'm just 
jump into the next piece, which is basically it's the same. It's a staircase. In this case, is a, a staircase. It's a um, it's a 45 meter uh, staircase long that goes down 30 meters in a in an old. Uh, the, the the space is is quite impressive. It's an old Roman mines that were turned into into uh, caves cover the Champagne, uh, the, of Champagne in, in Rennes. And uh, I had the, the possibility of working with, with this staircase, which is just itself is a, is a quite an impressive space. And in this case, what I worked, instead of using the, the steps of, as pixels, what I did is to actually work with the handrails no? and generate sort of work with this sort of potential circulation of the of the staircase where uh, in this case there's light and sound but it's the same principle like every every pixel of light is treated also with a pixel of sound so what you hear what you see is what you hear and it's not that important what you hear but when and where you hear it And in this case, at some point, you will see that the, the, the staircase is actually sort of the, the structure of the, sta of the staircase allows you to think of it as a sort of sequencer, even no? a, a sequencer that is happening in, in space. It's very when you think about the timeline of how uh, music is composed nowadays. It, it's quite it's a sort of translation of that uh, certain parts of the piece, but in. Uh, in a space, no? and it's very different when you are inside of the piece, you perceive it in a way, while when you are outside, you perceive it in a very different way. And just to finish, I would like to to say that I'm opening next uh, is a is a piece of the same series in Paris in La Défense uh, for the 60th anniversary of of La Défense, and it's a it's a piece that is going to to take place in a 2,000 square meter underground hidden space, and it's going to be there for four months from the 5th of July to, to October. So if you, it's free access, so if you drop by Paris, uh, yeah, I will be happy to see you around. Thank Thanks. you, and sorry for the... Thanks, Paolo. <laughs> okay, then we will go for the work of the digital artist Sean Caruso. Uh, he's working with sound design, 3D animation, uh, lighting and video mapping. Uh, but he's a specialist in immersive uh, media and full-down projections, mm -hmm. and he currently works at SAT, Montreal, um, assisting artists in, in their audiovisual immersive productions. Yes. Sean? Yes, thank you for the invitation. Um, I don't think I'll go into detail on any one project, especially since my most recent creations have been uh, mainly focused for the dome, and since we're not in a dome on a flat screen, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult to... to to share that, but I suggest if you guys want to see uh, my most recent project, visit. It's playing here at Sonar 360 uh, for the next two nights. Actually, it's playing in loop, so you can see some of my work there live at full res in an actual dome, which we're really lucky to have here at Sonar this year, actually. So I've been working at SAT uh, in one way, shape, or form uh, as an artist since 2013. Uh, it's been two years now that I'm working, uh, that I'm working full time in the production studio as a video project manager. So. Like you'd mentioned, I, um, I work a lot with the artists and helping them identify workflows and techniques and giving them the tools that they need to create for our dome, uh, the satisphere at the set. So you guys asked me the question, uh, how do I work? So I think I'll just go through my workflow actually, or my creative process and kind of my, 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 where I find my inspiration uh, rather than, than really focus on one specific project. But I do have a few examples, uh, video. So like most ideas, you know, it comes as this sparker that's flashed through many, many sources of uh, inspiration, quickly followed by like a super intense, uh, rigorous, creative workflow. So we're going to step back a bit. First OS, 
Windows 3.0, 1990. So now we're going to do like the, the artist path of it. So uh, my parents thought it was a great idea to buy me a computer. And it essentially worked how they imagined. It took me off their hands for all my, all my childhood and my adolescent years. And uh, while I kind of explored the intricacies of this new machine and you know, uh, gaming a bit and trying, uh, experimenting, you know, but not really understanding what the, the creative applications were that were available uh, to me at that time, but actually I wasn't really that interested until I found my first creative trigger, which happened to be a taste for electronic music, uh, which happened to be jungle. Uh, jungle music. I don't know if any of you know this, but in Toronto, where I grew up, we had a really strong drum and bass scene uh, during the 90s. So uh, even though at nine years old, I was too young to go to the raves, I was definitely old enough to, to, to understand the complexity of the rhythms, the sound design, and knowing that there's this technology behind it and needing to explore this further and just asking the important questions and being truly inspired by the machines that make these sounds. So uh, somewhere between calling up the local BBS and uh, our first internet service provider, uh, well, consequent, consequently, uh, we started downloading things illegally. That was my first download, by the way. It's less naughty than I'm sure some of yours. Uh, it's just, and Adam F, circles.mp3. So the first track that I pirated, but also the very moment that I realized that we can share media over the internet freely, and we can share software the same way, which led me to finding my first uh, digital audio workstation, which happened to be um, cool edit by Centrillium Software, or as many of us might know it today, uh, Adobe Edition. Or, yeah, Adobe Edition. So I was kind of using this, this software to create my, my first soundscapes, my first uh, beats and rhythms, mostly through loop-based composition. So not long after getting my first uh, software sequencer, so I got my hands on Fruity Loops, which uh, many of you that work in audio back then probably, probably know. Uh, so between this and Cool Edit, I was writing my first full compositions. So eventually, that, that after leaving high school, I pretty much developed my workflow to a point where I was able to write and mix my own tracks professionally, uh, releasing a number of vinyls on different drum and bass labels, and uh, experimenting a lot more with outboard gear, synthesizers, uh, samplers. But eventually, uh, getting too comfortable and like you know, trying to change things up, looking for an adrenaline shift, uh, I decided to go to the place where crea creativity uh, pretty much essentially dies. <laughs> and after that gig for four years, let me tell you, I was uh, pretty stoked to get back out there and to create. So I, uh, I decided pretty much in 2011, when I got out of the military, to devote myself um, to completely to creative exploration across many mediums. I was just hungry, I just needed knowledge, I just needed to, like, this sort of release. So I finished my first uh, full-length experimental album. Uh, I began working with visual toolkits, Quartz Composer, Adobe, always with the intention of creating my own visuals for my music. And literally not long after, I, uh, I played my first Mutech in Montreal, uh, in my first AV performance. So it happened very, very quickly, uh, very explosively. But along the same time, uh, running in parallel, uh, I began experimenting with stage design, uh, 3D animation, video mapped installations, and VJing for different production companies uh, throughout the province of Quebec, from underground parties like 200 people venues up into like festivals with 10,000 people. So it was after the first few events that I, when I started to play live, that I realized, okay, I need to have total control over the environment. Absolutely, like I'm not going to be doing video mapping anymore with a lighting technician that's colorblind. I just this doesn't work, and there's many of them. So, so I, uh, I decided that I need full control over every fixture and every piece of equipment that, that, in the venue except the sound. So I started, to, um, I started working with moving heads, any sort of lighting fixture, doing LED design and pixel LED mapping, lasers, and of course creating these sort of, uh, well, as you see here, this is at Mutech. It's a little bit fast, but these sort of LED structures that, with the whole idea of extending the stage out into the venue and creating you know, connecting the venue together, creating some sort of entity, always with the reflection of immersion somewhere in the back of my head. You have to immerse the, 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 the audience in this sort of universe. So the first time I stepped in the dome, this is pretty much what <laughs> happened. Uh, the dome pretty much shattered my paradigm about everything I thought that was possible with uh, projection mapping and, uh, and immersive spaces. And I knew without a doubt that uh, I needed to create for this space and explore further uh, the possibilities in immersion and the dome. So I'm not sure if I have a... 
the video. Oh, forget the sound. So pretty much since then, and this is in the satosphere in our lovely 18-meter uh, dome in Montreal. So since that moment, the first time I stepped in the dome, I've pretty much focused all of my energy into full dome creation and exploration. Uh, I realized my first, my first two films in 2015, 2016, like short 3D animated uh, films for the dome, Multiverse and Surninos. Both of them won prizes at various festivals across Europe, full dome festivals across Europe. So I knew in my head, that was like my validation, like, okay, I'm doing something, I'm on the right path, I need to like dig a bit deeper. Uh, so this past January, I released Visit, the film that's playing here, that kind of uh, explores more different cinematic aspects and how it translates into the, into the full dome or the immersive, uh, immersive film. Personally, I feel there's a lot of ground left to cover, uh, and that we're just starting to scratch the surface with what's possible in, in this medium. Even though the dome is, the satisfier has been open since 2011, I feel every artist that comes through there brings a new piece of tech or a new idea on the table, and it's, uh, it's just ex ex extremely uh, inspiring place to be working at the moment. Yeah, so there's a sat there. That's a satisfier if you've never seen it. Uh, the mother, <laughs> I call it the mother of all domes because in 2015 I bought my, all, my own dome. Actually, I bought a 13 meter dome and started touring across uh, Canada and the US with it. And actually, not long after, I got the call to start working there, uh, working there full time, which is super, uh, like I was saying, it's, uh, it's very inspirational to work with the many artists that come through there every year to create these kind of original uh, full dome pieces and performances. So, this is my desk every time I leave the office for an extended uh, period of time, and this was this morning. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure if they miss me or they're trying to replace me. <laughs> I don't know, this was in my inbox. I just wanted to share that quick. So we can come back to how do I work? Uh, well, from the, uh, from the initial idea or this sort of creative trigger, I throw myself into a period of research where I'm kind of uh, exploring what are the workflows, the tools, the techniques that I'll need to, to realize the project. And this can go from, I'm talking about sound design to video production, anything. This is kind of a global uh, creative flow. Throw myself into some production, uh, quickly alienate myself and kind of distance myself from anybody that's gonna break my, my, my creative flow. And then start doing tests, start rendering tests, start seeing my friends or talking with peers and getting this sort of validation. Seeing what works, doesn't work. If it works, I run with it. If it doesn't work, well, flush it or try and rework it. So I go back and forth a few times between validating these tries and then, and then uh, the reworking period. At that point, I haven't seen the sun for about a month. In Montreal, that's not a big deal. Existential reflection is always important in this process. And of course, finally, presentation or not. And I put a question mark because I have so many projects just, that just don't get released. But I don't think it's, it's the actual presentation for me if, if it's presented, then that's a bonus. Okay, it's cool. It's because it was the right time, the right place, the right moment. If not, well, uh, well, I put it on the hard drive. I save it for another day. And of course, all of these, all of these parts can have moments of uh, pure delight or pure madness. Mm -hmm. Can anyone relate a bit? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So quickly, because uh, running out of time. Uh, creative triggers are where I draw my inspiration from. Well, music, music and soundscapes, trying to visualize, uh, trying to visualize uh, how that would look in maybe a, in a 3D environment or a 360 environment. Intense emotional states when I'm like really up and down. Often that's when I find I make the most music. A good story is always nice. And my last two films actually uh, were inspired by um, modern conspiracy theories, but very loosely, a very loose narrative. I won't get into it, but I mean, a good story, a nice... Uh, can be the base for, uh, for, for a project for me a lot of times. Redefining volumes and spaces, coming into a space, trying to imagine how I can rework it with lighting and uh, video. And the most one of the most important ones are the workshops of the group creative atmosphere, uh, other artists working together to achieve a, a common goal in a very tight time frame. And I've hosted and attended, I could not even count the number of workshops over the years that I've actually participated in and how, uh, how inspirational I, I, I find these environments. 2D artwork, trying to, to imagine it in, in 360. Collaborations with other artists, the back and forth, uh, the process of working with someone else and sharing these ideas. And the number one for me has always been new tools in tech. So this has always remained my number one source uh, of inspiration over the years. You know, the fun of playing, playing with a new toy. 
you know, a new gadget, a new piece of software, seeing how you can work it into your existing workflows, your exist existing pipeline, and just pushing it. So uh, it's a great time, too, to be a geek in 360, because these tools are actually rapidly changing. You know, every month there's a, there's a new piece of software, a new piece of gear. So just some of the software that I use on a weekly basis, depending on the gig, and that's not even being exaggerated. And if I was to put the amount of plugins in there as well, <laughs> I mean, and plus with, uh, with uh, SAT's research department, we always have some new toys and some new uh, features on our existing software to play with. So I mean, it's, this, it's a never-ending cycle, and this is what's really been driving me uh, and keeps motivating me to, to work in this industry as an artist, digital artist. So I think that answer is how do I work, but not only how do I work, but why do I work? Uh, and thanks. OK. Thank yeah. you, Sean. Thanks. Yeah. And sorry for going <laughs> over. I'm just like. Then we have a short time for question and answer. Uh, I have one. Some of you have mentioned it before, no? But I would like to go indeed to that question. How do you think about visuals in relation to the music? Uh, sometimes you receive, you make the music, and then you think about the visual part, or is a back and forth process at the river sometimes? No? Most of you have mentioned it before, but I would like to, to know more about your approach and your experience on that. Maybe Paolo, you could start. For me, I guess, I guess the, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the answers are going to be quite different from mm -hmm. each one of us, no? But it, that's probably what makes it different. But uh, for me, there's no difference mm -hmm. actually, and the, it's all about perception. It's a lot, It's all about sort of what I find very interesting about both light and sound is that they are sort of the medium. They are not the the intended object to be perceived. So I, for me, it's very interesting to actually shift that sort of paradigm and make them the object of perception. And when you do that, you start sort of uh, appearing, it starts to appear interesting things. No? Also, maybe something that is worth mentioning is that both have memory. Those are both are mediums that has memory. So what you're, where it's getting to your, retin your retina or your ear is, is basically uh, a sound or, a, or, a, or the light itself that has been bouncing around and has been taking the memory of all these sort of points in the space. And you are, what you are seeing is actually not an object, it's the light that it's, take, that it's been bounced in that object and taking sort of the memory it has changed the... the uh, some people, if, if there's any physician, physicist here, it probably is going to cringe. But the, that this, this, the, the, the wavelength of the of the uh, the color, the, 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 the combination of pixels, allow you to perceive that. But basically, for me, it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's not. There's no difference, and it's what they can actually portray in terms of perception. Mm -hmm. In fact, what you see is. What you hear, no? At, at the yeah, it, uh, it applies to the quote of mm -hmm. Rican. Yeah, that's probably the, the the perfect summary. Okay, great, thank you, Nazare. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think I have uh, worked from different uh, methodologies because I come from a photography background, mm -hmm. so very much like uh, photography, you know, um, uh, ways of understanding, you know. The, so the sound was just nothing that I was uh, approaching to, and all, always. So I, I went into cinema, so sound is a uh, rhythm and is part of the cinematic experience. And then now I'm working with more with the production of the spaces and uh, creating uh, the sound from, um, you know, from data, from the environment, from different kind of uh, inputs. But then my recent or more ongoing work is actually as exploration I'm doing because I want to build up this uh, music box, this uh, um, um, speculative uh, big music box that you go inside. So then I'm developing a translation methodology of uh, recollecting data from the environment and then translating it into sound, sound sheets or sound scores. So traces can be traces from a target um, sheets, you know, where I'm can be some bullets, or can be just uh, traces from some stones or from ancient times. So then uh, it's always a poetical questioning and always kind of bringing the poetical uh, gesture for me is very important. So the, that project will go into a life score 
of uh, performed by four musicians, two opera singers and two uh, double bass and uh, live music processing. So I work in, with, uh, co in collaboration with musicians and try to work with compositional ways or methodologies of mm -hmm. understanding. So it can be the visuals can be first and then you translate it into sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit complex, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I missed the question. <laughs> in fact, you you talk about that in your presentation. Oh, I'm sure. I know. I thought I thought I already made the link, but it's, sorry. How do you think about visuals in relation to music and the process? It's different things. Oh, uh, I think it's think first. Uh, first one thing and then the other. It's a back and forth, or it's the yeah, same. Yeah, like like I had mentioned, I think that mm. it depends on the project. I, I've I've done both actually. I've I've started uh, a visual project and then created the music for it, which for me is. Um, it, it's much more natural than to mm -hmm. uh, start with the. Uh, it depends, actually. It really it depends on the context and the mm -hmm. mood and, and the, the project, project completely. Sure. But I don't think that you, I don't think there's necessarily a priority in the order in which you do it. It's just how the project kind of organically uh, flows, especially in collaborations. I mean, mm -hmm. with with other artists, I find that it's sometimes it's one or the other, and it just happens that way. And yeah, and in yeah. your words, if you do both visuals and music, you mm -hmm. make both at the same time, no? Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and it's back and it's it'll after that it's just a process of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, Tom. Um, anything to add? Is this on? Oh yeah. Um, I think ground zero for me when it comes to audio visual work was Alex Rutherford's music video for Autechre, where he animated every single tiny bit of a sculpture to go in time with the music. Um, he was on acid when he came up with the idea, which I can sort of understand. And I think everything I do is always quite psychedelic as well in terms of that you're always aiming to have, a, I don't know what the right word, a singularity, where the audio and the visual is just one entity um, that hits your brain at the same time and there's no separation between each, mm -hmm. each aspect. Mm -hmm. So that's always the aim anyway. Yeah. Right, so I think we have short time, uh, maybe we can have questions from the audience, or I don't know if you have some. Please, there are some questions. Can maybe you have uh, some question from one of each other? Maybe maybe a few comments. Comments? Yeah. You would like maybe. to add something? No, I no because I, <laughs> okay maybe one for each of you, but but first Tom because I was I was digging through your site and I found under the bridge. Oh yeah. Yeah, which actually I, I quite enjoyed this the this piece and made me think of um when we're going to end up in this like this uh, state with this with augmented reality this persistent digital uh reality that's going to that's going to follow us or be layered on top of our actual reality I'm thinking does that not seem like some weird tamagotchi out of control? Could you imagine this thing living like Yeah. Um, um <laughs> Yeah, God, I, I made that a long time ago. I know, I, I it's, it's one remember. of your older works. But I was just thinking, because these guys are just walking down the street and they, f they find this, like, giant, how would you... How thing. Would, I don't know. Thing, so this, like, 3D uh, organism that's kind of suspended between an underpass. And, you know, they're examining it. But I know with a lot of the work that I've been seeing in AR and stuff, I'm like, can you imagine when these sort of digital organisms are going to be actually there in the space when we're going to have this persistent like yeah i think stuff like <laughs> that would be really good in ar like being able to create realistic Cre yeah objects cre yeah yeah uh, anyways it just made me th think of that i had this uh, this flash of like oh the, you know these digital pets is sort of like weird massive tamagotchi and that you know can kind of uh ha like live in these spaces publicly yeah. that people will actually be able to see and i don't think that we're far from that anyways cool. i quite enjoyed that the quite that scary. Video, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. Just coming back a bit, coming back a bit to to your to the previous general question that mm -hmm. you you throw. The there's also I mean there's something you asked precisely about the relationship between the visual part and the sound part. But I I find also quite interesting how you just the visual or the sound you can I mean you you talked about sound but you talked about music and. Uh, for instance, I think it's very interesting when you start questioning actually if sound, first if sound has to be music, which, you know, Cage or mm -hmm. Senaki's already have uh, addressed like 
but I think you can even go further. And uh, okay, I think we are yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just yeah. I, yeah, just I, different I, cases because some of you work with sound, some of you work with music, some of you make music, some of you recite music, no? Or but I think there's a, an interesting translation how things, how strategies from sound can go back to light and actually rethink how light can be used and the other way around. No? And in fact, it's the same, no? For me, it's like it's a frequency that you can but culturally see it or you can not, hear it. No? Th that's what is interesting. Cul culturally, is very rude. You understand, I mean, when you think about sound, 90% uh, of the time you would think about music, which mm -hmm. is a very precise timeline, which uh, mm -hmm. portrays uh, emotions uh, or, so it's a kind of very, but sound is actually much more wide. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. And it, I think it's interesting when you actually open the, this sort of range right. of things. Yeah. Perfect, maybe we can leave it with that uh, okay. reflection. Okay, so thanks everyone and thanks for the audience Thank for listening. You. Thanks. Thank you.